Welcome to Food for Thought. My name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau from Compassionate Cooks. I founded Compassionate Cooks to empower people to make informed food choices and to debunk myths about vegetarianism and animal rights. You can learn more about who we are and what we do by visiting our website, compassionatecooks.com. I have some very special words to share on behalf of two different sponsors today. The first is from Ann Parker in Houston, Texas, who is sponsoring today's podcast as a dedication to her daughter, Jenny, who is in college in Fort Worth, Texas. Ann wrote and told me that our podcast helps them support each other despite the distance between them. Jenny, here's what your mom had to say about you. She wrote, Jenny is an incredible, loving, and compassionate young woman. She is my inspiration, and she makes the world a better place just by being in it. I'm so glad we can share this part of our lives together. You both sound like very special people, and thank you for letting me be part of your lives through this podcast. Today's other sponsor is Jim Corcoran, who has sponsored this podcast in the past, along with his partner and activist extraordinaire, Ray Sakura. Ray's birthday is coming up, and Jim wanted to sponsor another podcast in celebration of Ray's birth. Let me just read to you what Jim wrote. Ray, this is to you. When you came into my life, you made it so much richer. The laughter and love we share every day makes all of our work for the animals, people, and planet far more bearable. Your incredible depth of compassion is inspiring. Your sensitivity to the plight of other living beings has opened my eyes wider. I marvel at your ability to connect with nearly everyone you meet as you plant seeds of change in most of them. You are a precious gift, and I am honored to be your companion on this journey through life. I adore you and wake up every day with a smile on my face knowing you are with me. You are a beautiful person, Ray Sakura, inside and out. I love you with all my heart, and thank you, Colleen, for the inspiration and education you give to both of us. We love you and all that you do. Oh my, this is just like a love fest we're having here. So, <laughs> it's so wonderful. Thank you, Jim. And happy birthday, Ray. It's very special to memorialize you on this podcast. And thank you, Anne and Jenny, for, for your podcast sponsorship and for being the people that you are. If you would like to, you too can sponsor an episode in someone's name. Just visit CompassionateCooks.com and click on Support Our Podcast. And then let me know if there's anything in particular you would like me to say. Thank you, everyone, for your support and for listening. And if you'd like to drop me a line, you can do so at podcast at CompassionateCooks.com. I love hearing from all of you. As promised, today we're going to talk all about food, about good food, delicious food, plant food. And this is just part one, so, you know, there'll be plenty more to say about this. There's just a lot to say. In fact, today's episode is a little longer because there's a lot to say, so you can pause whenever you like if you don't like the length of this particular uh, podcast episode, but I try to keep them under 30 minutes, and I hope I have succeeded today. In a previous episode, I mentioned a study that confirms that people are not eating their vegetables. We're not eating our vegetables. So all that nagging that mom did was justified. Uh, So today I want to talk about ways to incorporate more vegetables into our diets and, and give you some tips for making it quick and easy. And of course, because I just can't help myself, some of what I'm going to talk about goes deeper than just, you know, throw a carrot in here and throw some broccoli in over there because the food aspect is really the easy part, especially once you replace your old habits with your new. What I want to get at is changing the way we think about food, changing the way we think about eating. So let's start with my first point. The first point I want to make is identify the craving. I've heard people say things like, well, I tried eating vegetarian, but I just craved meat. I just craved meat and Some of you have heard me say, maybe you've heard me say this on this podcast, that it's not the flesh of the animal we're craving. We're not true carnivores. We're not lions. We don't crave the flesh of an animal. We just don't. We don't pass by birds or squirrels or cows and think, oh, yum, that looks so good and start salivating or whatever. But if you think about how lions or just domestic cats behave when a prey animal is within reach, it's very different. Lions get really excited when it's time for them to eat and they relish the raw flesh of their prey. Not so for humans. We don't crave the sinews and the tendons and the muscles and the blood of animals. In fact, we don't want to know what it is we're actually eating at all when we do eat. 
meat. Um, we don't want to see the blood. We don't even want to hear that there is blood. But especially in light of the kinds of things people are eating these days, we do crave fat. We do crave salt. We crave sugar. We crave texture. We crave flavor. And all of this is available in the plant foods themselves and, of course, in the herbs and the spices with which we flavor our food. And in fact, if you think about it, all of the things we flavor our meat and our animal products with are plant-based. Think of all the condiments we use, depending on where you live. Ketchup, mustard, barbecue sauce, relish, vinegar, horseradish, hot sauces, chutneys, salsa, tamari or soy sauce, wasabi, various curries and tahini and think of all the staple plant foods that we use to add flavor to our foods like fresh garlic and fresh ginger and onions and lemon juice and lime juice then there are the endless arrays of spices and herbs and I don't even have time to go there there's just like a million of them but if you go to compassionatecooks.com and you go to resources under cooking and nutrition info there are two documents one is called spice herb substitutions. Um, so if a recipe calls for cardamom and you don't have any cardamom, I suggest what you can use in its stead. The other document is called which spices herbs to use. And it basically goes through a variety of spices and herbs and ways to add them to food and, and how to add lots of flavor. So this is what I'm always amazed by. I'm always amazed when people say, oh, vegan food, but you know, it's so bland. Um, no, it's not. All of the flavors coming from the plant foods. So it's quite the opposite. And don't forget that we're the only creature who, before eating meat, needs to not only cook it, but also to add flavorings, to add spices to it before we eat it. So no, the flavor is in the plants. So identify the cravings. So what do I mean by this? So one suggestion I offer is that when we think we're craving meat, people say, okay, I just really was craving meat. I was really craving dairy. I was craving eggs, whatever it is you say, whatever secretion or chunk of a poor animal we say we're craving we need to identify what it is we're really craving this is especially useful when transitioning from an animal-based a processed based diet um, because your palate is coated with salt and sugar and animal fat so what i was saying before is you know if you think that food is bland part of it is because you've lost all sensitivity to the true flavor of foods particularly plant foods because obviously they don't have all of the fat all of the saturated fat um, and all of the sodium that's in the meat and in the dairy. You might think you're craving meat, but what I'm suggesting is that you're probably craving fat. So, so look to the ways that you can actually fulfill that craving in other ways, in healthful ways. You might want to toast some pine nuts and sprinkle them over your pasta sauce. You don't need to use non-dairy cheese for everything. You know, you don't need to find an exact substitute in the plant kingdom. So you don't have to always rely on something like a soy-based cheese because the cheese is what that's fulfilling. Again, is that fat craving. So there's the fat, there's the salt, so instead, why don't you just sprinkle some pine nuts, toasted pine nuts, mix with a little bit of salt over your pasta sauce. You can add walnuts to your oatmeal. You can add sunflower seeds to your salad or other nuts or other seeds. Throw some almond butter in your morning smoothie. Heck, make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or an almond butter and jelly sandwich. Top your chili with non-dairy sour cream or avocado. Add non-dairy sour cream or guacamole or avocado to your burrito or your fajita. So you see... If you identify the craving, you can better find the thing that will fulfill that need. If you're craving salt, make something like tempeh bacon, where you steam the tempeh and then you marinate it in some tamari. And tamari, by the way, is just a Japanese soy sauce. It's brewed longer than Chinese soy sauce, and it has a fuller-bodied flavor. I love it. I prefer it. I never use Chinese soy sauce. So marinate that steamed tempeh in tamari, maple syrup, water, and liquid smoke, which you can find in any typical grocery store. Just, just a few drops will do. Make a tempeh BLT, a tempeh bacon and lettuce and tomato sandwich. You can have tempeh barbecue. Again, steam your tempeh and then throw some barbecue sauce over the tempeh in a casserole dish, bake it in the oven for 20 minutes or so, and make a hearty barbecue sandwich. Bacon is one of those things that I often hear people say, but I love bacon. I could never give up bacon. Well, first of all, yes, you can. Second of all, it's not the intestines of a pig that is getting you really excited, right? I mean, come on. No one's like, woohoo, pig intestines. Um, but seriously, I mean, again, it's that salt. It's the fat. It's that cured, smoky flavor. That's what bacon is all about. That's pretty much all bacon is, salt, smoke, and fat. So try my tempeh bacon or use tofu and do the same thing. And for those of you who are used to that flavor, that ham flavor, try adding liquid smoke. So add a little liquid smoke to your favorite split pea soup 
soup and see if that doesn't do the trick. Liquid smoke is just the condensation that's captured from the smoke that's created by burning various woods, such as hickory or mesquite, and a little goes a long way. So err on the side of caution. But you get the idea. Identify the craving. So what if the craving is sugar? Well, first of all, I do find that our sugar cravings subside when we start to eat a whole foods plant-based diet. That doesn't mean you'll never want some chocolate, but that you know desperate desire for sugar does tend to subside. If you stop relying on refined sugar for your sugar fix, you'll find that, that you'll be more than satisfied by fruit when you want something sweet. So the more you base your diet on whole foods, the less you crave the crap that you think you could never live without. In my new cookbook, which is coming out in the fall of 2007, it's all baked goods. It's pies, cookies, cakes, breads, confections, muffins, etc. And I have a chapter in there called Defending Desserts because I use sugar in these desserts. My theory about sugar and sweets is that we've stopped considering them special foods. Rather, we eat them with abandon and think that we're almost entitled to have some kind of treat, some kind of sugary snack every day. And my feeling is this. Again, if we're making whole foods the foundation of our diet and reserve sweets for special occasions, and and that could still mean once a week or a couple times a week, then we can get away with just enjoying plain old sugar. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? And it also means that we don't have to have the whole pie, you know? Sometimes I just keep um, some semi-sweet chocolate chips in the house or dark chocolate chips and just snack on a few of those for a little chocolate fix, and that's it. It does the trick. But anyway, the point is look to fruits, look to dried fruits, raisins, dried apricots, dates for sweetness, particularly here in the U.S. And especially here in the San Francisco Bay Area, we are so spoiled. I mean, everyone seems to have some fear that we're not going to have enough or that we're, we're going to be deprived somehow. For goodness sake, have you seen the size of grocery stores these days? I'm overwhelmed when I go into a kind of a conventional big grocery store because I tend to shop at my little local grocery and it's small and it's I like it and it's just a few aisles and I know the people who own it but when I go into some of these larger grocery stores I'm just struck by how spoiled we are because we have so many choices and and we don't live in a society of deprivation but we act like we do we're turning to a more simple way of eating again relying on plant foods for satisfaction and sustenance is a much more satisfying way to live well I mean at least that's what I found that's that's what certainly works for me uh, so, okay, number one is, is identify the craving. Does that make sense? Number two, give it time. Another important point to make, you have to understand that your palate will change. It will absolutely change. They say it takes three weeks to change a habit. And first, it's important to understand that the way we eat is just a habit. And that's the good news. Habits are meant to be broken. It takes about three weeks. And again, I don't like mentioning things that will date the podcast, but I want to say that I'm working on a project called the 30 Day Vegetarian Challenge, which will launch at some point in 2007. So if you're hearing this and it's launched, go check out vegchallenge.com. And if you're hearing this and it hasn't launched, just keep your ears open. You might want to join the mailing list so you'll hear about the announcement when it when it launches. The idea for the challenge is to guide people through this transition, the transition of going from a meat and dairy centered diet to a plant based diet. You'll get daily emails, we'll have weekly chats, and you'll just have tons of resources at your fingertips. So even though they say it takes three weeks to change, I like to give it an extra week, 30 days. So if you're considering eating vegetarian or vegan, just do it. Just try it because everybody says the same thing. Everyone says, well, you know, I don't eat a lot of meat and dairy. I don't, I don't eat a lot of meat and dairy. Well, then if you don't eat a lot, then it'll be really easy. But I suspect that people eat a lot more than they think they do. When people say, I don't eat a lot of meat and dairy, it's really remarkable because you really don't know how much you eat until you stop. This applies to anything. You just don't know how much sugar or oil or meat or dairy or eggs or whatever it is, um, how much you're eating of these things until you stop. Because first you realize that the things you automatically reached for before were meat, dairy, and eggs or whatever it is that you're that you're stopping eating. And the other thing is that you notice an entirely new world of choices open up. That's what I mean when I've said that being vegan is more expansive than anything you've ever experienced before. You think it's going to be restrictive because you've been looking in one direction your entire life. You're not even looking over in this direction to see everything that's available. It's also more expansive because animal-based products displace plant foods. So every time we choose meat, dairy, and eggs, we're not choosing healthful plant foods. We're not choosing the vegetables and appreciating the vegetables for all the flavor and for all of the, all of the options. Does that make sense? 
Now, I eat pretty damn healthy, and I'm amazed at how there's always improvements I can make. It's very exciting. I mean, there are always more roads to go down and new choices to make. And because my diet is based primarily on whole foods, I never crave the stuff that I craved five years ago, two years ago, whatever. I think some people think that when you're vegan, you're secretly gritting your teeth and clenching your fists and suppressing some latent desire to eat meat or dairy or eggs. But it really couldn't be farther from the truth, at least in my experience. My palate and my system just rely on whole foods and whole ingredients. So though I do occasionally, like I said, enjoy chocolate, I'm only human, um, it's certainly not something that I need or, or that I eat a lot of. It's really amazing. I always talk about how peanut butter is just, you know, like ground peanuts, right? I mean, that's essentially what peanut butter is. It's just ground peanuts and a little bit of salt if you want, if you want a little bit of salt. But I grew up eating the like the jippy or the skippy or jiffy or jiff or jip or skip or whatever it's called i grew up eating that stuff and i just think about all the crap they put in that stuff the preservatives and the oil and the sugar the oil they add is so that we don't have to stir because you know like the oil from the peanuts naturally separates right so there's often this little pool of oil when you open up the jar but heaven forbid we have to stir so the manufacturers add oil to keep this, to stop this natural separation process. And it's usually in the form of partially hydrogenated oil. It also extends the shelf life of the peanut butter. So I was doing a class recently and I, I went shopping for the ingredients. And one of the dishes was a stir fry made with peanut sauce, a peanut stir fry. And I went to my usual grocery store, one of my usual grocery stores, and I grabbed what I thought was just, you know, the natural peanut butter off the shelf. And I got home, and I was prepping for the class. And, of course, I couldn't resist opening the jar and having a little forkful of some peanut butter. And as soon as I put it in my mouth, I knew it wasn't just ground-up peanuts. I knew there was sugar in there. That's how sensitive my palate is. I knew immediately there was sugar ruining my peanut butter, ruining it. I looked at the ingredients, and though this was – Again, a more natural peanut butter, so it was sugar instead of something like corn syrup. It was still sugar, and I was still I was still aghast. And there was also palm oil. So now my peanut butter had saturated fat. So again, it wasn't trans fats, you know, hydrogenated oil, but still, and sugar. It was so gross. Now, several years ago, that wouldn't have been gross to me. I grew up eating peanut butter laced with sugar and, and all the other crap. And I know people who've tried the natural peanut butter, the truly natural peanut butter, and didn't like it because it wasn't sweet. But trust me, there's no need to add sugar or oil to peanut butter. It's a good example of how you can transition off of foods that are satisfying or familiar to you. Start by removing some of the familiar product, whether it's cow's milk or dairy butter or sugary peanut butter, whatever it is, and make you know a quarter of it non-dairy milk and non-dairy butter or truly natural peanut butter. And then just keep changing the ratio until you're at 100% of the healthful plant-based choice. Okay. So anyway, so to recap, number one, identify the cravings. Number two, give yourself some time. Give yourself some time for your palate to adjust. Number three, Prep in advance. I think one of the best ways to eat more vegetables is to prep your vegetables in advance. Tell me if you've ever done this. You've, you come home from the grocery store or the farmer's market, and you're so proud of yourself because you have all these vegetables. And you come home, and you unpack, and you throw them in the fridge, and you pat yourself on the back, and you leave the room. Later on that night, it's time to start thinking about dinner. So you go into the kitchen, you open the fridge, and you look around, and you say, Oh my God, there's like nothing to eat here. So you call the pizza guy or you open a package of frozen something or other and you leave those vegetables just sitting there, right? Have you ever done that? So now imagine what it would be like if you came home from the grocery store, you took 15 minutes to chop up some vegetables. You stored them in the fridge in bags or containers, and then you came into the kitchen for a snack or to make dinner, and carrots were chopped up, and peppers were chopped up, and garlic was minced and stored in a jar, and ginger was right there, having been peeled and minced and stored in a jar. Imagine, you would actually eat those vegetables. You'd snack on them and you'd make a meal out of them, I guarantee you. But somehow there's like this mental block. If there's like a carrot top or a stem or if the broccoli is still connected at its at its stem, we're just like, oh my God, it would take so long to cut that carrot top off. <laughs> it's like so ridiculous. But that's a block for us. So 
My suggestion is when you come home with your groceries, take 15 minutes to chop some up. I don't care if you're busy. Recruit some help if you can. Grab your partner or your kids. Get your handy-dandy food processor out. You can check out my recommendations in the Compassionate Cook store. You just um, you can buy it from that store as well. You just go to Stock Your Pantry from my homepage. And you mince up some garlic and, and, and ginger separately and um, you keep each of them in a jar and you throw them in the fridge and now when you want to make a soup or stir fry or a salad whatever you have all these ingredients here so how long will these vegetables keep once they're chopped up well they'll start to lose their freshness after four five days so eat them don't just let them sit in the fridge and if you eat them after five days they're not going to kill you they're just not going to taste as good or be as fresh so eat them all right And I also have people ask me, well, aren't the vegetables going to lose their nutrition value if you cut them up and put them in the fridge? The amount of nutrition value that you're losing is so minimal, but what's the option? Right now, you're letting the vegetables stay in the refrigerator and you're not eating them at all. Now, weigh that against cutting up the vegetables in advance and losing like a minimal amount of nut- it's not even worth it's not even worth worrying about. So, stop with that excuse. Okay. Um, uh, the next thing related to that, don't wait until dinner time to decide what you're going to have for dinner. You should know the night before what you're going to have the next night. Okay? So, again, When you come home from the grocery store, chop some vegetables, but also in the morning before you leave for work, chop up some vegetables for the stir fry that you want to have. Um, Make the sauce or the marinade for the stir fry. Prep some vegetables for the soup or whatever it is. Make some quinoa. Find 10 to 15 minutes in the morning to do this. You don't have 10 minutes? Find 10 minutes. It's not that much to ask. Think about it. If we can't take 10 or 15 minutes a day, and sometimes it's a little more than that, but okay, let's say 30 minutes a day tops to prepare healthful meals for ourselves and for our loved ones, then I think we need to reprioritize things. I'm talking about 15 to 30 minutes a day. And sometimes it's not even that much because you've prepped the day before, let's say, and you have everything ready for, for that day and so you don't have to do anything. I mean, just it's just not that much to ask. Now, keep in mind that if you chop certain vegetables in advance, they will need to be stored in water. Things like potatoes or yams or carrots, sweet potatoes. Otherwise, they'll turn brown when they're exposed to the air. So just put them in a container of water and just cover them with water. So in the morning, again, before work, you can throw on a quick pot of chili that you can throw in the refrigerator and just heat up when you get home. I have a great chili recipe in my meals in 30 minutes recipe packet. It's just a matter of opening up some cans of beans, rinsing and draining them, opening a can of tomatoes and some corn, rinsing and draining the corn, um, adding some fresh chopped onions, some peppers, and some various spices. It's so easy to make. And you can serve it over rice or you can serve it over cornmeal or, you know, polenta or cornbread and with a nice salad. And it's great for lunch the next day, too. So that's something you can make the night before or, um, or that morning before you go to work. The night before or in the morning, you can also chop up vegetables for a huge salad that you can use for that night's dinner and just put together when you get home from work. Chop up vegetables for, um, for a curry dish that night, like, like cauliflower, yams, um, yellow potatoes, broccoli, whatever you want to put in the curry. You can make some quinoa the night before or um, when you're watching TV or before you go into the shower, just throw on some quinoa uh, with some water on the stove. It doesn't take long to cook, so definitely set a timer. You can plan on having burritos, and all you have to do is make some rice in advance and then chop up the lettuce. And then when you get home, you can open a can of beans, set out the salsa, set out the guacamole or just avocado, um, non-dairy sour cream, tomatoes, etc., and then everybody can serve themselves. There's so many ways to do quick meals. A little tip for becoming inspired to cook more and to cook more vegetables, obviously, is them through some of your favorite vegetarian cookbooks and your favorite recipes. Set aside or earmark those that you want to make. Just looking at recipes can actually inspire you to make them. And I might even make a shameless plug at this point to recommend that you get my DVD. I mean, my cooking DVD was made for you. I made it just for you. It's a fun, engaging way to inspire you to make delicious plant-based meals, including the chili that I just mentioned. And it answers lots of nutrition questions questions and it's still being offered for five dollars off the original price so check out the dvd and you can also build your own cookbook using recipe packets from my site get the kids involved if you want to instill good habits in your children have them cook with you there's so many ways that you can do this and if you're a young person listening to this as well you can you can 
have some responsibility in the kitchen, um, obviously in ways that are age appropriate. They can um, choose the recipe. They can chop something if they're older. They can add garlic to the food processor. They can stir something. They can be in charge of keeping an eye on what's ever on the stove, again, if they're older. You can have them be in charge of taking the ingredients out for whatever recipe you're making and having them put them all out on the counter. And that's another tip. Before you cook, if you're going to make a recipe, get all of your ingredients out and put them on the counter. It makes it much more enjoyable and less stressful not to have to run all around as you're trying to put it together. Again, in light of what I said before about not planning your dinner at dinner time, I think planning your meals in advance makes a lot of sense, and I think you'll make healthier choices as well. So if you think about it, we're only planning our meals in advance. If we do this in a week in advance, we're only doing it for about five days, right? Five nights, because we may eat out one night, and one night we might do takeout. So just about five days. And because we rotate the same six or seven or eight dishes over and over, this is really easy to do. You can decide something like Monday night is soup night or stew night and you can rotate what will be each Monday night so maybe um, one Monday it's my garlic and green soup that I keep um, encouraging you to try uh, with a salad and you know some bread some whole wheat bread and the next Monday maybe it's carrot ginger soup and again accompanied by a salad and then you just go back and forth with those for a while until you're ready to change up your soup recipe Maybe Tuesday night, it's stir-fry night, and you can do um, one Tuesday night with the peanut sauce and a variety of seasonal vegetables, and the next Tuesday night, it's Chinese stir-fry with other vegetables, bok choy or carrots, cashews, whatever. Um, And again, check out Compassionate Cooks for recipe packets. We have so many different packets to choose from. Perhaps Wednesday is Mexican, which is frankly fantastic because... Mexican food is just always really, really quick and really fast to whip up, whether it's chili or burritos or fajitas or no queso quesadillas. Uh, Thursday night can be, I don't know, Thai, pick a cuisine, or a theme like sandwiches. And maybe Friday night is pasta night, which gives you a huge range, or it can be pizza night. Um, You can do pasta with marinara sauce or pasta with vegetables. You can do lasagna or baked ziti or stuffed shells, a lot of which you can do in advance. The options are endless, but I think creating a plan like this will make a lot of sense. And then Saturday night, you might eat out. Sunday night, it might be takeout, you know, something like that. But I think a lot of us appreciate the predictable, perhaps more than we'd like to admit. And we find it more comfortable when we have a routine like this. And so do family members, especially children. They really like routine. And if it isn't clear yet, everything I've mentioned thus far uh, is, is they're not only healthful options, but they're inexpensive ones, too. You can certainly add things like meatless crumbles to your chili, but you don't really need to. The beans themselves are fantastic. And if you buy dried beans that you soak and cook yourself, of course, it's even cheaper. Buying tofu and tempeh and whole soy products, it's much cheaper than buying meat. And it's much cheaper than buying a lot of the vegetarian meat. So if you want something textured like meat in your chili, then try crumbling in steamed tempeh or tofu. Better yet, freeze your block of um, tofu or, or your tub of tofu, extra firm or firm tofu, uh, water and all, just You have it in a tub, you have it in a block, whatever. Just throw it right into the freezer. Okay, and then the next day or months later when you are at your counter and you're chopping those vegetables in the morning before you go to work, just take out the tofu from the freezer and leave it on the counter while you go to work and let it thaw. When you come home, you open up the tofu, you drain the water, and you squeeze all of the water out of your tofu. It will be like a sponge. Tons of water will come out, and you'll start to notice how porous it is. And this is a great time to actually marinate the tofu, or you can add it to a soup because you've created all this room in the tofu, and it will better soak up any marinade or broth that you add to it. Or you can just eat it as it is once you squeeze out the water, or you can cook it up, add it to a stir fry, whatever. I love it once I squeeze it out. I really love the chewiness and I just add it to my salads. And it's also great for adding to something like chili. So again, you don't have to get the vegetarian meat. You can just do it with the the thawed tofu. And again, it's much chewier and, and crumbly than if you hadn't frozen it. It has a great, great texture. So when you're relying on plant foods, the cost is the cost of eating is incredibly reasonable, particularly when you're relying on, on local foods. You can frequent your farmer's market. I mean, if you have a farmer's market near you, just go there every week. If you're creating a plan like I suggested, you'll be able to pick up the vegetables for that week at the market. You can also join something called a CSA. I don't know if you've heard about this, but it, CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. And it's basically a system by which the consumer has a direct relationship with the grower. So... 
Each week, or however you set it up, you'll get a box of vegetables delivered right to your door or delivered to a pickup location that's convenient for you. And the produce you're getting is local, you know, grown just a couple hours away. It's fresh. It's just harvested. It's mostly organic. Most of it's organic, it tends to be. And it's seasonal, and it's delicious. So... Keep in mind that though you will often receive staples like onions and garlics, I find that I still need to go to the farmer's market because we do eat so many vegetables. But also keep in mind that this will change the way you cook a little bit. So in some cases, it won't work for you if you want to create a rigid plan. In other words, you'll get some vegetables that you've never cooked with before or that you didn't plan on using that week. So it kind of changes the way you cook. We're used to looking at a recipe, listing what we need, going to the store and buying that. This is kind of the reverse. You're just getting the the vegetables, the produce that are seasonal, which is so exciting. I actually think it's really fun because you're getting exactly what's grown in that season. But then you have to think, okay, what do I need to, what can I do with this? How can I eat this? Now, many of the CSAs, many of the farms also include recipes in the box. So that, that helps. That's a, that's a lot of help. So now CSAs are, um, ridiculously prevalent around here in Northern California. And I imagine Southern California too, but they're popping up all over. So just type in community supported agriculture, or there's a website you can go to called, um, www.localharvest.org slash CSA, you know, so localharvest.org slash CSA. Also keep in mind that there are a lot of things you can do without an oven. I hear from students a lot, and I want to make sure they know I'm thinking of them, too, when I offer suggestions. Many of the cooking classes I teach are not in kitchens, so I don't have access to an oven. But what I bring along with me are my little portable burners. They're like what you'd use for camping or outdoors or whatever. They're gas burners, and they're fueled by a butane cartridge that I buy separately. And you can actually check out, again, if you go to compassionatecooks.com to stock your pantry and under countertop appliances you can see the little burners that I use and you can also use an electric or a plug-in skillet if you can't have an open flame where you are like if you're in a dormitory and that's you know 40 bucks or so but now you have a plug-in skillet and you can make stir fries and pasta dishes and just a whole array of things and again they're in my store as well. There are a ton of things you can also make without needing to cook at all, obviously. Bean salads, again, just relying on the canned beans, though they're a little more expensive. Sometimes it's just more convenient. Green salads. I mean, just make huge green salads with tofu or um, beans, whatever you want to add to it. Cabbage salads, like my tantalizing Thai slaw, which is always a hit when I make them for classes, when I make it for classes. Sandwiches, like the one I call my sloppy call, which is basically roasted red peppers, carrots, avocado, sprouts, lettuce, whatever you want to stick in there on a bun or pita bread or Italian bread. There are so many options. I also have a document up on the site called Vegetarian Lunch and Dinner Ideas. It's under Resources and Cooking and Nutrition Info. It's called Vegetarian Lunch and Dinner Ideas. And so there's more fast, fast meal ideas for you. Truth be told, I think we eat a lot more than we need to. And I think we think we need to eat a lot more than we need to. We're really programmed to make sure our plates look a particular way, that it's not enough just to have a super salad or just a salad for dinner, that it has to look a certain way. The important thing is that we eat a healthful meal, whether or not it conforms to our society's standards or even our own ingrained standards of what a meal looks like. Remember I said earlier that we definitely don't use food just to sustain us and we don't there's so much attached to everything we eat there's so much emotional stuff we bring to our meals because eating is also a time for social engagement i do think it's important that we sit down at the kitchen table or the dining room table together and we talk with our friends and our family members turn off the tv get away from the computer put the blackberries aside and just engage with one another over a healthful meal. The kitchen is the room in our house that we all naturally gravitate to and we all congregate in. Dinner time can be a time to just be still, to just exhale, to nurture our bodies, to communicate with our loved ones. It's very gratifying and satisfying to eat a meal that was prepared with love, that is shared in community, and that created the least amount of harm in the process. There is so much joy in knowing that no lives were intentionally harmed in the gathering of our food. With each bite you take, may you receive peace and savor the awareness that with each bite you take, you are also creating peace. This is Colleen with Compassionate Cooks. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.